We have assembled three CEOs to talk to you. On my right, Julianne Alro is the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of Brisbane Airport Corporation. Uh, she also serves on a number of boards, which I'll get her to talk about. Uh, Daniel Musson is the Group Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Institute of Management, and he's had a very varied career, which I'm sure will come out in our conversation. And Anne Cross is the Chief Executive Officer of Uniting Care Queensland, runs a bunch of hospitals and thousands of people across Queensland, and tells me that her calm exterior belies what? <laughs> I just said a I, calm interior? <laughs> I said, if I haven't done my meditation, you'll know, really. <laughs> so please make the panellists very welcome. Um, and do remember that you can go to your app um, and send me questions. And if you can't be bothered, just say oi loudly and um, I'll get a microphone to you if you have a question. So rather than starting in the kind of rarefied world of strategy and culture and people management and change, I just wanted to go to each of the panellists, perhaps starting with you, Anne, and say, given the sorts of challenges uh, that this group of people have been presented with through various speakers in, around superannuation, what are the big challenges that keep you up at nights mm. around healthcare? Mm. Um, we're living in a world probably a bit like yourselves where I think there's unprecedented change uh, happening. Um, so my world is uh, healthcare, aged care, disability services, uh, child protection services. And in every one of those sectors, there's an extraordinary amount of um, transformation uh, that is already signalled. Um, and then we've got the, over, you know, the overarching issues of things like the intergenerational report, which of course um, has been well known, most of those trends for a very long time, and the digital, uh, digital and technology stuff. So we've just uh, um, uh, built uh, and opened the first, or the most advanced, uh, fully integrated um, uh, digital hospital in Harvey Bay in Queensland. Um, and, um, you know, our guess is that within two years, someone else will have done more than what uh, we've done. So extraordinary rapid change that's happening. Uh, and at the same time as looking at how do you bring that, uh, th that, that innovation uh, in e-health through to, you know, the whole of the population. So extraordinary challenges there. And, 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 and what about the, the pace at which that happens? First of all, there has to be an acceptance at a board level and in terms of an organisation that something needs to change. But then the question is what and which rein do you pull first? For example, I'm sure someone's come into your office and said, there's this thing called Watson and it knows everything. It can suck in every medical book and you just tell it where the wart is and what colour it is and Bob's your uncle, you've got to die. I've had that conversation. And did you buy <laughs> hundreds of them and put them in every, every workstation? Uh, no, but we are buying lot, you know, sort of robots for surgeries and all sorts of other things that are going on. But uh, well, look, the pace is an interesting one. You know, I think for any leader at this point in time, the, the single biggest challenge for a CEO and other people in leadership roles in organisations is actually to continue to build that adaptive capacity so that you can keep, you can ride the waves of change and figure out when you've got, you know, a major disruption that you've got to actually do big change at versus that continued to evolve your strategies. So, so I think that's the single biggest thing. It's not, it's not about just managing change. It's actually that capacity, that adaptive capacity uh, to keep riding the waves of change, because clearly that's going to be with us for quite a long time to come. Dan, you're nodding away. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, the, the idea of being uh, of adaptive leadership or, uh, you know, the ability to uh, build resilience within your organisation and, and capability in your organisation is basically what we focus on. So uh, I took over this role at the Institute just over uh, 12 months, 13, 14 months ago, after the four state divisions merged to form a national organisation. So we've had an operational challenge over the last 15 months creating an enterprise model. But, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here because there's a, there's a massive disruptive change that's going to occur in the space that we operate in, which is about developing leaders for the future and having building capacity in organisations to help them achieve their visions. And, and how does that manifest in education and the training part of our business is a move from where knowledge was once all-powerful 
to now it's completely democratised and accessible uh, through your palm, on your palm in the, in, or your Watson mm. to get the answer to just about any question you want. Mm. Now, that means that... It doesn't the, mean it's a good answer. doesn't mean it's a good answer, and, and it doesn't mean it's, uh, it's, a, it's applicable to your situation, which is where experience and other things build around that. But, but what it does mean is it means that once when uh, education was delivered in a format that said, come to university between six and nine on a Wednesday night mm. and a expert will tell you something, mm. it's all different now. So we've got to adapt from our perspective to help build the leadership capability in organisations to help them achieve their vision. And we've got to deliver that in a completely customer focused way. And so I, I talk about education being the last bastion of a product product-centric sort of uh, 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 model, and it's transitioning to a customer-centric model, and all the debate we hear with Christopher Pine and, and, and at a government level and public policy level uh, at the universities and the difference between the group of eight and everyone else, and the private sector where we play is, is really this debate about what's transforming and, and how do people want to get and, and take that education and, and uh, training benefits. Um, Look, and I, I may not be speaking for people in the room, but that's, what, that's part of what I find scary. I think that's part of why we can't all agree that, you know, there's climate change, because, you know, you're a PhD in climate science at Oxford University, and I've got a mobile phone with a Twitter application on it, and we're both the same. Yep. I, if I drop these, they'll fall to the ground. Yes. That's gravity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to what extent do you push back against that? And that's certainly a question here. Hey, I want to move my funds around. I want to be interactive. I want to, don't do that, you fool. You yeah. end up with nothing. Yeah, yep. So it's, like, it's kind of like, how do you, to what extent do you, go, do you go with a trend? And to what extent do you say, no, I'm going to come back to the good old fashioned 1950s education piece and say, I'm going to save you from yourself? Yeah, well, look, I, I don't think you can, I think one of the risks of that model, and we're just talking about everyone's sick of hearing about Kodak, but the lesson Kodak teaches you is you, if you believe, yes. you, you, can, you can be a victim of your own success. Yeah. So we can look back at our education system and point to any number of things that would be, we would deem as a great success, mm. and that would be a reason not to change. Mm. And, but that's where you can get stuck. And that's the risk that we face, is that the human, pe human beings do not like change, in fact, Mm. They almost abhor okay. it. <laughs> and that's what you've got to yeah, do. Yeah, that's right. Julianne, what keeps you up nights? Well, I suppose running an airport, uh, the thing we always focus on first, you know, middle and last, is safety and mm. security. Yeah, that, that's the fundamental thing. It's it not the coffee. Oh. It's not the coffee, no. It doesn't... <laughs> and I will say, it won't keep me awake at night. I'm, I'm very comfortable we've got the right set of systems in place, but it, it's a... Um, it's moving very rapidly out there, particularly on the security side of things. So that's something we, we're finding, yeah, particularly at the moment, um, things are moving very fast. Well, the increased demands for security? Uh, the, the, the different sort of threats that are emerging, different technologies. Again, we talk about technologies. When I started back at airports, you know, when most of you guys were still probably in your mum's arms, uh, you, you could negotiate with a hijacker. They expected them to want to live. Nowadays, that that debate doesn't occur, the, mm. you know, it's no debate, it just turns up and it happens and you're picking up the pieces. So how do you anticipate that? How do you have the right sort of protections and the layers in there? So, you know, that's just part of our world and, and, and we, you know, constantly focusing on that. But we're also um, an infrastructure business, mm. um, long-lived assets, very expensive assets for those of you who are familiar with Brisbane Airport, as you might may be aware, we're building a runway. Um, we have shareholders, um, we may need to make sure that there's a good return mm. on, on that, that investment, um, you know, that equity gets treated properly in the process. So we've, we've got most of our solutions in place now, but it's been a long and hard journey because airlines are, are approaching airports very differently nowadays, more disruption. You, you know, the low cost model has given airlines much more power mm. um, over an airport and less desire to negotiate. So the process of making sure that as you go into your reinvestment cycles, you've got your commercial agreements in place mm. and are, are underpinned and stabilised um, through these long lived assets. Um, is really hard and very difficult and um, has been a big challenge. And so, I mean, part of what you're doing, I guess, is you're, you're doing a whole range of different things. You kind of, sometimes you look like the AFP, sometimes you look like Frank Lowy's Westfield, sometimes mm -hmm. you look like you're negotiating uh, the hardest negotiation of all with Qantas and Virgin and Jetstar and all the rest of them. Um, as a leader, and you've got teams doing all of that, as a leader, what do you see your role as in, in managing that disparate business? What's, yep. your, what, what, what's the most successful attribute you need? Yeah, I, I think the ability to create good teams, 
and to you know to hire in the right people and and to give them the the skills the structures the resources they need but but then to sort of keep it all under control and guided and make sure it's going to the into the right directions so it, it's that constant you know sort of stewardship of of that process mm. um, but underpinned by i think good recruitment and 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 good solid systems and, and last year gonski was here david gonski was here talking about the role of the chairman which is a different role to the ceo but as chairman he thought it, uh, to be most effective um, he imagined himself as the conductor so he wasn't, perhaps you're the lead violin, each of you. <laughs> <laughs> you can be lead cello. Yeah. Concert yeah. master, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's how he imagined his role, that he could sort of take the lead violinist out for coffee and suggest that she might like to play with another orchestra. <laughs> but that, that's how he said, how do you, how do you imagine yourself? Oh, look, in lots of ways, the, um, I think the, the CEO role and the chair role are a bit like shared conductors. Yeah. Uh, each got their own domain that they're principally responsible for, but if they're not aligned, then you will not succeed as an organisation, I don't believe. You know? yeah. So it's really, really critical that um, not only is that relationship really strong, but that the kind of conversations that you have as a board uh, and as an executive and as a CEO, it's particularly critical to keep trying to, um, you know, focus what the conversations are that you need to have uh, with the board and to get those conversations sharply defined. And, and, and do you see that as part of your role to, to sharpen and improve the conversation? Uh, at the board level? Uh, uh, well, I think, it's, I think it's absolutely the role of the board mm. to do that, but I think it's also the role of the CEO to support that. I mean, clearly a CEO has to um, enable, uh, be part of enabling the board to do its work. Mm. Uh, so a board's only successful if, they're, if, you know, if the executive are uh, actually supporting them uh, to do their work. And at the same time, the board, of course, has to support the executive to do, uh, to do their work. So, so it's, a, it, it's a quite a, it, you know, it can be a challenging kind of relationship to get the, the domains clear about who's working in what. Uh, but the, the, the need to, uh, to actually be singing off the same uh, mm. music sheet is really, really critical mm. um, and uh, equal, you know, but both terribly important. And uh, Tom Garcia came in here at the beginning of this session. Julianne was saying that you know, around, the, around the question of embracing the digital world and engaging with superannuation members in the digital world, this has been interesting because you know, you've got to kind of walk and chew gum. The directors have got to get religion on it, and then you've got to have enough uh, enough change agents in the organisation to say, "I got an idea, I got an idea, I got an idea." How does that play out in your world? Yeah, um, <clears throat> just going to answer that question, but also reflecting on something that Anne said. You know, board members, um, and I've got extraordinary diligent board members but they don't work in the business day to day. You know, they just don't know as much as you do. So you've got to find a way. And do you say this as a, as a director on other organisations oh, and, as well? And indeed, and it's not my role to, mm. to run, you know, a tourism body or a, or a theatre company. Mm. I'm, you know, I'm there to help them with strategic guidance and support. So, you know, your board, ed, your board members have got to be supported by management with that right knowledge. And I mean the right knowledge, not, you know, heaps of stuff where they get just overweighed by the information you can throw at them. It's got to be distilled and, and, and put there carefully. So if you don't have that trust and that alliance between management and board, it's going to fail because mm. it's, it's not going to happen properly. And, and I think digital is, is such a challenging and it, it, it even, you know, we've been trying to do it, um, define digital strategy. And it, when, it, when it embraces so many things from, you know, how you might process a, a bag in a new system, you know, all the way to how you may be, you know, managing a, um, a, a construction project. Everything's digital nowadays. Everything's, but what does it all mean and how do you connect it all together? And I think, you know, I know I wrestle with that. I know our board wrestles with that. And then you've sort of got the dark side of all that, which is cyber security. Mm. And as you become more digital, you know, are you lifting that petticoat just a little too high and putting yourself at risk? And how does, you yourself as a CEO and as an MD and your board members know that by going down this path, you're not creating a whole range of new threats and, and challenges. So uh, it, it's a, um, I wish to say there was an easy answer to all those things, but it's, I think it's awareness that on this hand, there's all these opportunities and then there's these risks. And I think we probably come back to textbook, you know, 
risk management processes, mm. understanding risk appetite, and, and understanding that if you have no appetite for the risk, you may well go the way of the codex. Yeah. Mm, mm. Inertia might be another option too. That would be my personal choice. Oh, <laughs> well, I think we're back to Kodak pretty quick smart at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, what do you think reflecting on this? Oh, I couldn't agree more. I've got a board that's been formed of 14 different directors in a gerrymander around the country. Um, they're well-meaning volunteers uh, in many ways, and to your point, they don't, they don't understand the operational part of the business that the management team live in every day. Mm. You cannot corral that without a partnership with the chairman that is strong and that the, with a strategic direction that's clearly understood by everyone. So everyone owns the strategy? Well, I think, I think uh, my view on that is management owns the development of the strategy and the board owns the, the endorsement of that strategy to meet what the stakeholders expect of you. Mm. But the strategy is a tool actually to stop. We talk in our organisation about levels of work. What level are you going to operate on? Mm. And the challenge with levels of work is if you dive down into the, a, a bottom, a, a, another level below, so if I start doing an operational role, mm -hmm. I might feel good because I get something done, mm. but the person whose job I've just taken feels completely disenchanted. Mm. Want to go and, wash the car. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Why am I here if you're yeah. going to come and do my job? Mm. And the same happens for a board and an executive team, I think, is that, is that you need to be able to maintain where your level of work is um, to make sure that you're adding value to that whole process rather than trying to come and do the man management's job, and I think management's job strategy. Mm. We were hearing in um, a session earlier today um, about the ways in which um, industry funds might uh, collaborate to come up with investment strategies so they take back uh, control of investment strategies, and perhaps that underscores this question. We've talked a lot about strategic alliances between our funds as a way of accessing scale. How do you find and foster the skills that are required for successful collective activity and avoid the agency issues associated with collaboration? Um, who'd like to take that one? How do you get on with Max Hale Wilson? He's gone now. <laughs> um, I, I worked for Max for many years at Sydney Airport and uh, Max and I got on very well actually. I, I thrived and prospered under Max and uh, he'd be truly appalled but, but he was actually quite a good mem mentor um, even though Max would never want to be anybody's mentor. Right. But um, I, I don't I think, I spoke before about um, funding our runway and how we had to approach that. And I think we'd approached infrastructure construction since the, um, the airports were privatised back at the end of the last century. It sounds so impressive, doesn't it, <laughs> when you say that? It's um, if it's very much um, bill, they pay. Um, we work out what we need with them, but the airlines, but on, on the whole, it was, you know, it was a pretty mathematical relationship. Mm. When we sort of hit the reinvestment, the big reinvestment cycle, you know, the, you know, the billion dollar projects and things like that, that methodology no longer worked. And we've had to form, with Qantas and Virgin in particular, genuine partnerships mm. so that they feel that by you know, helping us now fund that runway, their business is growing, that we're engaged in their business and we understand what they need to do and we're partners with them. Mm. And that, that's So actually, you're not just hitting them up for cash? No. Mm. We are, you know you know, genuinely doing things and working with them both in capital and OPEX and in, in also introduction of technologies like self-service and things where they're joint projects now, mm. um, that they feel that they've got that, that ownership. And I think when you're dealing with anybody in that partnership, particularly, uh, you know, if you're dealing with, you know, cross you know, businesses, mm. there's got to be something in it for everybody. You yeah. know, that, that, that idea of, you know, the dominant partner, that's a takeover, that's not a, mm. that's not a collaboration. And when you're doing it across, you know, the, the, probably the things that are either vertical or horizontal in your industry, it has, to, ha has got to be collaboration. But unless someone takes that leadership role mm. and, and creates that genuine, you know, series of needs and, and then works you know, to keep the relationship going well. Mm. Um, it, You're it sounding was like Hillary thrilled. Clinton at the UN. <laughs> I figured out what's in it for you, Russia. I figured out what's in it for you. I figured out what's in it for me. And this is why yeah. I'm doing it. And let's all move forward on that basis. Uh, hey? I don't, think, I, I don't think it's enough, as Julianne mm. said. I mean, my history, my career is littered with, you know, thinking, oh, it's a good idea to work together with someone and even agreeing that there's a good reason to work together, but then it actually not working. And why is that? We might grab another mic for Anne if we can, just a handheld. There we go. Um, Sorry, is that persist? problematic? Yeah. Um, uh, I think for me the learning is around the very careful work that you need to do to actually ascertain what people need ah. uh, out of this and the creating of that common 
kind of goal, the galvanising goal or the whatever that would actually sustain that. And then more importantly, actually understanding what the things are that get in the way of working together. So sometimes you might get the reason really clear and mm. agreed. You might even have, um, you know, a, a, a really... And we'll just turn this other one off. Thanks, fellas. That's a, very kind. A really strong uh, That's it. vision of, of, of what and why you'd do something. Um, but I've often found that it's actually then either in culture or systems or processes uh, that actually get in the way of that work actually happening well. I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you for an example. Um, Is that polite? Um, well, uh, let's go to a really kind of quite a low level one. But for years I was trying to get um, our hospitals to work together with Blue Care, you know, big aged care provider here in Queensland, uh, to, to assist in the discharge of people from hospital in a smooth way. Everybody thought it was a fantastic idea. You'd get teams together, people would work away with it. In the end, it was actually the business systems that were operating, mm. you know, at the hospital level versus in our aged care division, Blue Care, uh, that actually kept failing, kept falling. So, so the early work of actually both understanding the need, really mapping what it would, do, would, would take, and understanding how, what would happen, what happens on the ground mm. uh, around those things is really important. So whether it's a small thing, relatively small thing like that, or quite a big partnership, uh, and you know we've got numbers of big partnerships, I think the amount of work you put into the thinking, the planning, the understanding, you know what the whole kind of value chain proposition is, mm. uh, and what the systems are, is is really critical to mm. to make that work. Yeah. I'm going to sound a little cliched, but, but I, I honestly believe that, and, and I'll give you an example. I think at the, end, at the heart of this and the heart of this question is the customer. So the only, the only reason I could think of at a, at a top line that you would form a strategic alliance with people in this room to drive scale would be to reduce the cost of delivery, which would ultimately mean that your members would get a better return on their investment over the long run. That, mm. would, be, that would be the fundamental financial reason that you would come up with. Mm. But at the heart of that, the common interest um, rather than a secular interest, the common interest has to be that your members will get a better outcome. Mm. And the operational issue will be, well, what are the things that are common versus what are the unique value, value proposition that I deliver yeah. to this piece? And the bits that you are, are common are the things that you can put but together. But do you don't mind putting a dollar figure on it to just focus everybody's attention? Well, right I, 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 <laughs> well I, because I think if you don't have that clear objective, it's very difficult to know mm. whether you've succeeded or failed. Mm. So if you went through that exercise and you didn't reduce the cost, or you didn't get the benefits of scale that, that you were expecting, then it would kind of just be, why would you bother? Mm. Um, and, and so from my perspective, and the ex example I'll give is the conversation I had with Tom uh, a couple of weeks ago about this organisation and ours working together with the, with the aim of building capability in, in the, you know, the, the um, uh, industry super fund management and executive and governance teams. Mm. My day-to-day -day job is building out training and development uh, um, frameworks that, it, that build that capability and how do we connect those two things in partnership that mm. effectively and means that he can give better value to his members. Mm. And at the end of the day, I'm only successful if that happens, if yeah. the end member gets the value. There's a great question here. You have, we have fund members. You have have patients, travellers, burgeoning managers and shareholders. What do you do to understand what they need or want when you build your strategies? I think this follows on from that. From mm. my point is, yeah. you know, what we do in our organisation is, is you have to start with organisational culture perspective. So we've really started to move our culture away from this idea that our product is what we're about. It's mm. actually about... If only know, the fools had realised it, it'd all be good. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Uh, so, and, and our questioning framework is all of a sudden, tell me about your business. What are the challenges that you're mm. facing? And then we build a solution to that, to that model. So, mm. so the framework is really, you know, as simple as it sounds, is asking that first first question about what mm. is important to you, what is, what is keeping you awake at mm. night, and is there some way that I can help you in that, way, you know, in that model to be able to deliver that? Julia? Yeah, well, we uh, you know, don't do anything, I think, that's out of the box in, in terms of um, our various stakeholders, you know, starting with the, our biggest stakeholder, which is the travelling public. Mm. You know, we, we survey them, we have focus groups 
qualitative and quantitative to understand what they want, and you probably won't be very surprised that most passengers don't like queues. Ah. They want to feel safe and secure, and they want value for money. You know, they're, you know, so that's what we try and mm. focus on when we're you know, designing our terminals and things like that. Airlines want to make money. You know, they, they also, you know, again, be able, want to be able to get on and conduct their business. Um, they'd like us not to get have competition for mm. them, but that's not going to work. Um, we go and talk to our shareholders. You know, we have face-to-face -face meetings with them, trying to understand what they want, you know, from their investment at the moment. So it's really, it's face-to-face -face, mm. um, in, in many ways with the more senior of our stakeholders. And then we try and, you know, um, survey the rest in, 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 in reasonable ways. Yeah. And you've got the Wesley Hospital. <clears throat> You've got St Andrews Hospital, where I had my tonsils removed in 1976. You've got 400 locations, 15,000 people, 8,000 volunteers, not to mention all the people that you serve. How could you possibly figure out what they want? Well, let me start with the, the patients and the clients. So we probably have about, uh, we have, we have about 50,000 older people that we support across uh, Queensland and the Northern Territory. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and then 120,000 people who come through the hospitals, etc. Look, it, it um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a confession really, but I think we, we have had to change a culture that focuses on um, client, patient, resident experience, as well as, you know, the harder outcomes, the quantitative things that you can measure. Um, you know, I think we, you know, the health system is um, full of people who, who um, have a fairly good idea of what's important for you when you mm. come to our hospitals. Um, or in aged care, it's, you know, there's a sense that, oh, well, we know what's right for you as a person. So we've really had to do a lot of work of both, uh, you know, of shifting a culture that actually suggests that perhaps the professionals uh, only know some of the answer mm. uh, and not the whole of it. So we've, we've had to develop, you know, our performance frameworks that uh, take a whole count of um, experience as well as, um, you know, clinical outcomes and, the, you know, some of the things that are well understood to impact on whether your tonsil operation uh, was um, a good clinical outcome mm -hmm. for you or not. Mm -hmm. so, so those things have been known and measured, you know, for a very long time and there's all sorts of quality frameworks written around that. But there actually wasn't much on the experience end. Mm. So we, we've had to build both our frameworks to do that. Then, of course, we've got to actually work out how to measure it. Uh, and, you know, again, we're probably not doing anything that's too out of the box on that. So, uh, you know, we do... Um, uh, we've now got opportunities in our hospitals for every departing patient to give us immediate feedback that's mm. analysed on a weekly basis and every unit manager has it on their desk on Monday. Mm. So they and get immediate you, but, feedback. But how do you make that real? Because, you know, it's an impossibility. If you come into a hospital and give somebody great care and they're 95 and that great care mm -hmm. goes on for three months and then they die, yep. that's, that, that might come up in your clinical assessments as a great outcome. That's not a great outcome. But... <laughs> You know, there's a whole heap of things about, you know, end of life care and whether they've had the thought and all yep. the rest of it, yep. you know. How do so, you so possibly the, measure that? So the next layer, of course, is that you've, you do have to look longer term and you've got to try and, you, do, you know, you've got to have some mechanisms of following people up uh, post uh, the immediacy of it to mm. sort of have a look at what happens. And then, of course, you actually have to do evaluations, you know, which are more focused so that you look at what's happening in palliative care and you talk to, you know, you do your focus groups and you do your work with people and you follow people up to mm. actually understand what's happened for people. So accumulating that data and having mechanisms that where you actually are focused on understanding that uh, and adjusting behaviour because of it. I, I think that's the critical... There's no easy way about this, but you have to have that focus in your culture to start mm. with or, you, you know, you won't do it really. Mm. And, I mean, I could ask another question, Dan, but I, I suspect that the only possible answer to questions about change management are textbook answers, aren't they? <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I suppose, it, you know, the textbook would tell you uh, create a reason for change, uh, develop a framework to deliver it, and, uh, and then execute against that mm, framework simple. and measure it. Yeah. Easy. It, easy to say. S <laughs> simple, not easy, as I always say. Uh, um, there's another question here in terms of... Um, uh, on my sheet talking about how you get time to work on the business rather than just in the business, you know, and there's, there's lots of cliches around that one. How do you ensure you do what's important rather than what's just urgent? Maybe let's take another 
uh, perspective on that. How do, for everybody on the panel, how do your other hats that you wear, Queensland Theatre Company or adjunct professor at you know, University of Queensland there, Anne, in, uh, in health and service delivery and that sort of thing, how, how do they help um, for you getting out of your everyday business? Essential. I mean, in any industry, you get really focused on your own business and what's going on. It's fantastic to be in other people's worlds and have to, uh, you know, reflect on what's going on there and learn from that. So for me, it's part of my lifeblood. It is part of the way that I stay refreshed is by actually trying to dabble in, uh, um, you know, in other people's areas so right. that I, I truly, you know, have to grapple with, with big questions that, um, that other people face. So for me, it's really important personally. I think, you know, there's, I'm on two boards and well, three boards if I count my own, but uh, one is, is a theatre um, board and that's just passion. I, I love the theatre. It, it's not an easy task, but it's not a terribly time consuming one either. Um, but it, it does give you that, that uh, a chance to think about something totally different oh, yeah. and to engage yourself in a more creative world. Um, or artistic creative world than, than the more technical world that I inhabit day to day. Other things like the Tourism and, and Events Queensland Board, that's almost a job. Um, tourism is such an important factor and how um, you know, the government is, is uh, marketing Queensland and, and how they're you know, developing uh, you know, tourism programs, things into Queensland is, is very important to my business. And yeah. so, so that, you know, to me, I think that's almost an extension of what I do. Um, you know, for a company like um, BAC, you know, we like to think we are contributing, you know, back to the community, that by, you know, our sponsorships and our community engagement, we are creating Brisbane as a, or helping create Brisbane as a better place to live and work mm. and visit. And, uh, you know, I think that makes us, it's good for our staff, it's good for us as a company, it's good for us in, in a way of developing Queensland. So I think it's part of that social obligation as well. So the, the question was actually, where does the line lie for someone being on multiple boards? Could you be on the board of both the Sydney Airport and the Brisbane Airport? Well, well, I think on the latter part of that question, I think conflict of interest would be the, you know, the governance rule there. I would think it'd be unlikely, yeah. but there are people who are on our board that are on a smaller airport, you know, like yeah. a Darwin or a Perth, where there's less direct conflict. So, I, I think, in, in terms of being on different boards, I think conflict of interest is the is the is the guiding principle, and if you're in a good governance structure, that should yeah. be um, a logical. You know, process and you work through it. My board and I um, discussed when I took on the role uh, that they knew I was interested in non-executive work, mm. um, but there is a very strict principle, um, you, you know, you have a day job yeah. and none of those boards should interfere with that day job. Mm. And that's, that's the, the fundamental um, And that's why you have that agreement. balance of the two that you do. Yes, and, and as I said, tourism, as I say, they see that pretty well as an extension of work, yeah. um, whereas the, the theatre board is, is really after hours and uh, it doesn't really interfere with what I'm doing. I'll get you both to think, as I asked Dan another difficult question, brace yourself, Dan, um, about what your best aha moment was outside of what the Americans call the C-suite, of your, of your day job. What was your best at the uni or on another board where you went, oh, that's an interesting way to think, or that's a different way of problem solving. And while you're thinking about that, Dan, I'll ask you this question. I have a theory, Dan. Yes, Helen. <laughs> that you all need to wrap your arms around any elderly single men in important management positions. I'm talking about archbishops. <laughs> I think it's really important for archbishops and to, to have regular lunch meetings with other CEOs. Um, because they can tend to be isolated. But what's the potential for isolation on mm. the other side of the table mm. from them? Like, is that, a, is that a danger? Oh, look, I think we find, um, in particular in my business, that it's one of the... Uh, there's, there's programs out there, different things, the CEO board and tech and these other... which are actually built around this idea that it's very lonely to be a CEO. Mm. I, I haven't found that because I kind of tend to reach out 
uh, I'm inquisitive, and I think if there's a framework that, that helps drive uh, innovation, it's just asking questions and just being genuinely interested in different things. So, mm. so that's sometimes what the structure of a, being on a board allows you to do, because you can actually ask the dumb questions in a, in a certain, you know... Mm. And you have that outlet of yeah. sitting across the table from someone you wouldn't uh, otherwise uh, be sitting across the table from. And, and then, and then that, that just lends to a flow of, a flow of ideas. And, and I think, so, so what I'm saying is that's often hard to do internally in an yeah. organisation. And so finding ways to facilitate that conversation um, uh, is really important. And we, we try and do that in consortia style learning or other different things, which are designed to, to get public and private sector people in the same room. Mm. Um, people who are working in, uh, uh, in small business and, and, and corporations to be able to see what's common and what's different and then hopefully learn from each other. So mm. very valuable. To my curly question. Yes. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start. I think, um, I, I suppose it was something that I, that I observed when I was working at Sydney Airport and, and probably recently trying to deal with the, the runway issue. You might gather by now the runway has dominated my life <laughs> uh, somewhat. Um, I was constantly beginning pushed to say, okay, we've got, we've got this end or this vision of, of building this runway in a, in, a, in a particular way and funding it in a particular way. And everyone wanted to lay out every step mm. that we had to do along the way to get there. And I kept saying, well, well, I can't do that because the minute I do something, someone else will respond and my plan will have to be... And this was the stakeholders who wanted that sort of certainty of, yes, of the Yes, yeah, that they could see how it was all going to happen yeah. and, and be able to, you know, just sort of tie the... Yeah. Mm. And, um, and it, it was Max who, who um, told me this, that I want to know where I'm going and I want to know the first two things I've got to do to get there. Because yeah. as soon as you do those two things, something else will change and your third step will not be what you thought it would be. Terrific and, bit and, of advice. And you have to be flexible. And uh, I found a quote and it's from a, a German field marshal and it says, no plan in survives engagement with the enemy. And I've always realised that now. So the aha moment for me is be very focused on what you want to achieve mm. and why you want to achieve it and start the journey the way you want to do it, but be flexible. And you've got to keep on responding mm. and changing and adapting to what's going on. Because and managing the anxieties and, and of those who want the, the, the uh, yeah, cobblestones. That's, that's the hardest part. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, you, you know as I say, I'm not compromising ultimately where I want to be, even though the outcome may look a little bit different. Um, but it's, it's, it's that, honestly, that constant engagement and realising that all that effort you might put into thinking about fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, mm, eighth, ninth, tenth, is a total waste of time. Mm. Yeah. Uh? I was also thinking about strategy uh, to some degree and uh, the, some of the things I've learnt by, you know, talking to other people outside of uh, ourselves. Um, because it's a very, you know, I, I'm the CEO of a very large organisation, I have that constant challenge around how you get your strategic settings right for the whole organisation and ensuring that they make sense in the different parts and the different divisions and that you actually can get... Um, them to be really sharp, you know, right down there in a business unit or a... a you know. So I really... I, I'd learnt, I've learned an awful lot by looking at other big organisations that are, that, are, that are diverse and multi-purpose, you know, multi-business, multi-business strength, to try and look at how you get that overarching strategy uh, and then work at, well, does that make sense for you know, this uh, for our, we have, a, you know, we run the Lifeline business in uh, Queensland, all those shops, um, you know, 130 shops across Queensland. Um, it's pretty different to running a hospital. Mm. So how do I get a strategy that's right for that? Well, you know, going and looking at what's happening in retail mm. has been particularly helpful around that. And I have been able to link it back to our overarching strategy. It's a critical business for us. It delivers, you know, quite a lot of millions of dollars uh, for um, for services um, that that pay for the lifeline services in Queensland. Mm. Forty three million dollar turnover, um, and delivers, you know, very good returns for. Um, for it. So it's a critical business for us because the services wouldn't exist. They're not funded by government if, um, uh, if we didn't have that. So that, it, it's actually going, well, what's retail got to teach me about, you know, recycling in a charity shop kind of context? Mm. Uh, and I've had great insights through that. And similarly, looking at as age care moves into much more consumer-directed um, care, 
Yeah, well, you know, I've actually been looking at the retail industry mm. <laughs> and, and looking at all of the ways that, you know, service delivery, I mean, you know, and of course it's a very changing industry. Well, how is it changing? How are the channels for contact with customers changing uh, so that, you know, people can access your services easily? Um, you know, one of my, you know, one of the, one of the difficulties in, and most of you will know if you've had any contact with the aged care system is how the heck you get into it. I mean, you think you know, superannuation is complicated. There's nothing on aged care. Absolutely, absolutely. And everything that uh, the government does to try and sort oh. of do it just complicates it even mm -hmm. more. Uh, so the whole issue of how, you know, the easy channels of access for people, you know, are really critical. And you can, other industries have got way more to teach us about that than aged care has to teach us, quite frankly. So they're the kinds of things that have been helpful for me. And just briefly on that point before we move on, Retail telling you about aged care? Is that because of the customer centric thing Dan keeps yeah. talking about? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, well, we can go in any number of different directions now if we'd like to. There's questions on the board about um, personal issues and gender issues. And there's questions on my uh, sheet here about um, developing high performance teams and whether those teams can lead change. So we can start either way. Can I, can I jump into the gender equality? Sure. Mm -hmm. Just because I feel like I'm yeah. <laughs> out of balance here. Uh, no, uh, this is something... <laughs> Welcome to our world. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Don't, don't be nervous, Dan. <laughs> That's right. No, we, we, uh, we, we've taken a very deliberate step, and so when I saw that question, I'd, I'd just love to talk broad... broad so, broad. so this is the what role are well, What role are we playing in supporting gender equality and why? I uh -huh. think the, the, the why is the thing that I think often gets um, forgotten. We're focusing on three, when I talk to businesses about what they're trying to do, they, they talk about, generally they talk about productivity and innovation as the main issues in their organisations. And I'm, I'm being very generalistic, they, they apply different ways. But, but when you talk about productivity then specifically, we look at, we're looking at this sort of holistically and saying in Australia we have, we have three broad groups which I think um, will drive further productivity for the nation. Uh, the first is uh, youth um, and the fact that at the moment we've got youth unemployment at levels which are mm. way too high. Um, and, and if we were in a much more densely populated uh, country, we would probably find we'd, have, we'd be facing much more social unrest than yeah. we currently are. So, so that's the first group. The second is, uh, is aged workers or ageing workers. Mm. Um, so again, everyone, we we're talking about the intergenerational report, we're all going to work, work to we're 104 or something. And, uh, and so how do you actually help people reskill or cement the skills that they have to continue their employment and careers? Mm. And the third is women, and, and uh, women are underrepresented, and, and we've just recently had International Women's Day, which we focus heavily on in our organisation. But how do you get away from Anne's comment earlier, which was, yep, we all agree. Next. Yeah, so then, so then you get down to the specific steps. So what are the specific issues around, around uh, women in the workforce and, and the challenges that are faced? And we've just looked at our organisation and said, well, what can we do? So we have, as an organisation, signed the UN, UN Women's Empowerment Principles as a framework and a, and a flag to say, uh, as an employer, we want to in adopt that. We've engaged with the uh, Workplace Gender Equality Agency to do two reviews. One is to look at specifically the research they do around sal salary equity, mm. um, uh, because what we're finding is women are making decisions to do jobs and then getting paid less for the privilege of that, which is ridiculous. And, uh, and, the, second th and the second part we've asked them to do is to review all of our courseware to make sure we haven't got uh, an, an embedded unconscious bias in the, in the educational framework that we're delivering. Um, which we all think we haven't, but let's just make sure that we're part of the solution, not part of the problem. Mm. And so they're just three very, very simple things, that, uh, but they're deliberate. And it's not just, it's not just your point, it should mm. be better mm. and stop. So Shucks, what? it still isn't. So um, what? Julianne, yeah. um, do you see yourself as playing a role in supporting gender equality? I mean, is that part of your role or is that an HR function? Uh, no, I think, um, uh, look, it, it really, so many things, you know, as I've observed since I've been a CEO, is about leadership. What the CEO does, and something, and I think that it also applies to the chair and the board sometimes, your staff are watching that. Mm. And it's appalling sometimes how often they're emulating, uh, emulating, not emulating, emulating what you're doing. Sure. You know, it can, it, it's as simple as walking past rubbish on the floor, um, 
you know, to your, your focus on you safety is the standard, standard you accept. And, I, and, I, think it, and mm. I think it comes, you know, if you do have a commitment to something like gender equality, and I do, you have to have it manifest mm. in, in how you're doing things. So the sort of things, you know, I, I really, I want to see when uh, um, a job's advertised, there are women who are considered, you know, that, you know, when we're doing headhunting, they must put women on that, on that list. They must find mm. qualified women. We, we've got a particular um, emphasis on trying to get more engineering um, staff because we're still a very technical um, new focus So to do business. that, you've got to reach down to year 11, you've got to support them through university and you've got to get them out the other end. That's what you've got to do, isn't it? And, and we'll we do, partner with and, somebody and who we, does And we that. do work with, you, mm. you know, um, QUT in particular, but also UQ on, mm. on bringing some, some engineering skills um, you know, scholarships and then onto, onto the airport. Mm. But if we sometimes, you know, might have a, um, a part-time or a contract manager comes in and, and we, we're saying if, it's, if, if, if that's coming in now with talented women, we are hiring them. Mm. We're not saying when their contract's over, that's it, thank you. No, we say, come on and join us. Mm. And, and we are trying to, you know, identify them in different ways and as soon as we see opportunities now, we're taking them. Mm. But the first thing is to make sure they're, um, you know, they are being considered for jobs and that the interview panels are not... Um, single gender either, mm. Mm. so people aren't allowed to hire themselves all the time. Yeah, right. Mm. Um, I, um, I've been reflecting a lot in the last uh, few months about the issue of, of when did we start stop talking about sexism and start talking about gender equality? I mean, they're part of the same thing. The reason I've been thinking about it is that um, I've recently served on the Domestic Violence Task Force led by Dame Quentin Bryce here in Queensland. Um, and I have to say, I mean, it was unbelievably sobering. And if you've seen any of the interviews, Quentin's done, you'll have got a sense of the emotion that uh, um, we've all faced as we've listened to stories and tried to understand this. But at the core of it, there's just this deep, deep disregard for women. I mean, it is. There, it is an issue of violence, but it's also yeah. a real issue of, you know, the, how women are valued in our society. And I, I um, you know, I, I was truly caught up, you know, caught up short yeah. in that because, you know, I hadn't really, you know, had those conversations uh, for many, many yes. years. Uh, and yet, you know, and yet I'm having conversations all the time about gender equality and, you know, even though I work in female-dominated industries, right. it's still a problem. You know, it's still a problem once you get to executive yeah. and, and boards and things. Uh, you know, the, the pipeline doesn't necessarily deliver mm. people into, um, What's wrong with these into the position. Why don't they come through the yeah, pipeline? And, but, but it was really looking at what's happening in this, you know, the space of, you know, the fact that we have, you know, one woman... Uh, every fortnight murdered by her intimate partner. Mm. Um, you know, these are things that go, well, there's something, something much deeper here mm. than just, you know, this, than just, I say, uh, you know, equality of women. Uh, so, so for me, there is something about how we have these conversations uh, as a society and as a community uh, and keep, keep the consciousness high about this. And I think we've all... You know, I think corporate Australia, I think, you know, the public sector, the community more broadly has got a responsibility to uh, keep doing that. I mean, we absolutely need all the strategies uh, mm. that we're talking about. Um, but, 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 but fundamentally, we, we've got to I mean, to go we will back. move on, but there is a sense of what you're saying of at, at some point it is useful, although you will face a backlash, uh, to say, this is really, really broken. Let's step away from this that is, lovely... This is wrong. Yeah. This is wrong. Yeah. yeah, how did we get here? Yeah. And let's look... And, and, is, and is that useful to do at work as well? Or is that just a bunch of people saying, wow, she's upset after that task force? <laughs> I'm sure they're saying that, actually. Um, but, uh, but, but, no, look, I think we, we have many important conversations uh, in our workplaces and in all sorts of things. So I think it is just a conversation that yeah. needs to be had. All right, now there's a question on the board there about um, uh, how do you ensure the strategic plan approved by the board is meaningful and relevant on a daily basis for staff at the coalface. Can I add to that, and anyone can take that if they like, does it need to be? Does it need to be relevant on a daily basis for all the staff at the coalface? Or do you need, as, uh, as the, uh, one of the leaders from Google was saying to us, maybe you have a bunch of innovators in the corner who have a different swipe card and two mismatched socks? who kind of throw bombs at 
the people with the other uh, swipe cards. How do you, how do you, to what extent does it need to trickle down to that? Well, I'll, I'll start. You know, if I look at, say, if you're at the airport this afternoon, you'll see some guys driving around in cars and their jobs are to make sure that the airfield is safe and, mm. you know, get rid of birds and make sure this, you know, rubbish doesn't get onto the runway and things like that. Those guys have got a very specific job and their understanding of what we need to do maybe in terms of making our, um, or how we pay for it runway or make our retail business profitable is meaningless to them. Mm. What they need is that clear vision that we want Brisbane Airport to be safe. Mm. And that's part of our strategic plan, but that's their part of the strategic plan. And they need to know that not only is it needs to be safe, but it's got to be safe in a way that's efficient. Mm. And so there is a, you know, a, a value prospect to what we're doing. Not that it's a price on yes. safety, but <laughs> which we can do a lot more if we mm. do everything efficiently. So mm. they are sort of captured into that process of, of us, you know, driving and optimising our business, but still focused on their immediate, you know, part of the vision. And mm. I think you can sort of, you know, lay that right through the business as you look to each of the, of the, of the core areas, mm. what is their piece of the puzzle. Mm. But, but um, in, in terms of how we keep it alive and have that the board and, and ultimately shareholders are satisfied that we're doing it. We chunk it down into, into milestones. We review them every quarter. Um, there's KPIs um, and, and my general managers are terrified of the, of the yellow light or the red light that might, you know, because it's a dashboard type system. Mm. And um, if it's not green, you know, they're scrambling at, in, at each quarter you know, to come up with the really good reasons and see if they can actually turn it around. So, you know, we've really made it part of their, their deliverables each day. And the board always asks about the ampers and the reds. They never... They never worry about the reds, no. <laughs> but even every, every human being wants to feel like they're adding... We spend a lot of time at work. Hmm. Right? We just do. And every human being that I've ever met wants to feel like they're doing something valuable, hmm. whether you're driving around picking up rubbish and shooing birds or, or, or you're doing something, you know, in the back corner with your different coloured socks. Mm. So even those people, if their ideas weren't being executed in some point, would at some point go, what are we doing here? Mm. I'll go somewhere where some other organisation is actually going to value my input. Mm. So, so I think it's imperative that it links. Whether it links directly to the... And there's all these mechanism and management oh. tools that we can use to, to link it through to the strategic plan. But, it, but whether everyone understands that link to the strategic plan, but they need to understand the link to the purpose. Because mm. that's what... When you get up in the morning and the alarm goes off and you're going to drive up the M1 into, into Brisbane for 45 minutes before you get to work, and there's got to be purpose behind that. So mm. it's making that, that connection between the task and the purpose. And articulating that purpose, eh? Mm. I don't think I've got a lot to add, really. I think it's um, for people. It's always about um, what's important to them and what do they understand their job to be, uh, and where that uh, it'll always have a link to the strategic plan. And it's our job to try and make it sharp. Mm. And what do you say on in terms of leading change? Do you have little change units, or do you try and embed it? Do you? Uh, definitely embed it. Um, mm. uh, we do, you know, going back to the kind of Google idea. The closest we'd have to that is. Um, you know, we have an innovation, you know, festival and we're trying to run a culture of innovation that we use the tag EDGE about. Mm. Uh, and so we have things all through the year and, you know, different, different sorts of um, um, things going on that try and keep innovation alive mm. uh, within the organisation. So the ideas do get surfaced. Um, and we do, you know, have all of the typical things you'd have to um, um, uh, try and... Uh, you know, look at those ideas, uh, reward those ones that look like good ones that we're going to carry forward with, etc. So I think I think that's really important. You know, that that cult, you know, creating some kind of culture that um, really does support you know good ideas and that can challenge us. Really. The other thing we're doing on that space is mm. we entered into a partnership with um, QUT, Queensland University of Technology, um, in digital work, and uh, we've been working with their undergrads um, for the last three years. Um, running workshops and, um, and, and ideas festivals. And we've taken, I think even yesterday, one of their ideas finally went commercial. Wow. And uh, we're finding, one, it helps us with some of that uh, age diversity, because airports don't have a lot of jobs for young folk. Unfortunately, we tend to go into the experience area. Mm. So, you know, to make sure we've got that, you know, that young persons, those digital native mm. attitude coming in, we, we find having those relationships. Uh, we're doing a big workshop next week with a bunch of, uh, I think there's 40 now, 
uh, architect and engineering students to help us design our next terminal. Yeah. And uh, so it's good classwork for them, but we're getting those fantastic ideas and, and thinking about, you know, how our my own son is thinking, mm. um, which he doesn't tell me, mm. uh, but I need to get it some other way. So I, I find in those, those engagement with, with universities, and, and since we've done that, we, um, both Griffith and UQ have asked to be part of those sort of processes Wonderful. as well. So, uh, so it's I think another that's way, another, it's way another way of, way of doing it. You sitting on the Q, uh, Queensland Theatre Company board, or you go and talk to universities and you, you yeah. change your experience on a domestic violence task force, you give yourself as many opportunities to ask better questions yeah. as possible. Mm.